Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome. Uh, today, I, I would say that we have uh, a really exciting webinar for you, um, and a really special one. Um, today, we're obviously, we're talking about Biakart Salmon. Um, we have uh, Mathieu Roland Biakart with us today, who is the CEO. He runs uh, Biakart Salmon. And it's just a pleasure to, to have his time um, and talk to him about Champagne, uh, his experience, and what um, Biacard is doing today. Just a little bit about uh, Mathieu. He was um, born and raised in Champagne, um, living in, in I and living in Epernay, going to school in, in Rance, I believe. Um, and then as a young adult, he, he went to study in England um, and spent 14 years there, uh, learned a mix of, of Northern uh, English accents, Scottish accents, uh, <laughs> combined with a, a roommate from South Africa. So, uh, but he is uh, an excellent speaker of English and, and, and a, true, uh, uh, a true citizen of Champagne. So Matthew, without, Further ado, thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Eric, and, and thanks so much um, for inviting me. I'm super excited, and, and thank you for all for taking the time. I must stress that I spent 14 years in England because it took me that long to learn English. So, <laughs> so bear with me. And despite the accent, if you don't understand, just just please ask questions, and I'll, yeah, of I'll course, try and make it a little better. You are um, totally understandable. <laughs> What, what, what we've done uh, with Eric's guidance is to prepare for you a little bit of a presentation to try and guide our thoughts and, and tell you a little more of uh, our house and some of the approach that we, we take, uh, which is different to others. And, and really the, the, the purpose is um, we will also spend a, a bit of time talking about Founders Cuvée, who was very pinnacle of quality in Champagne and, and, and for Bill Carsalmon, that's the best expression. So, but hopefully the introduction I give you will, will help you understand the, the why and how we, these wines are, are, are as good as they are. And Matthew, so, something that I forgot to mention, by the way, I think, is that you are the seventh generation of the that's it. Beacart family. So quite amazing. I'm planning, I'm planning to put a tattoo of a seven on my forehead. But yeah. yes, you're, absolute, you're absolutely right. And I'm, I'm sure you. I'm sure you'll go into this, but you know the, the the you know chambers. We very much want to work with family-owned and family-run um, estates um, uh, across the world, and um, it's rare to find that actually uh, in a in a maison in in Champagne. So it's just a pleasure to work with you and your family. Well, thank you, and we we we, we you know we love the trust that we've got with with this, with the chambers team. Um, which actually leads me very neatly on, on the history and the foundation of the house. Um, so as, as Eric mentioned, we, we, the last family owned and run Champagne estate. Um, so the house was founded in 1818 uh, and I'm a direct descendant of the founders. Um, so the house really is created when my great, 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 great grandfather a gentleman called Nicolas Francois Bilicard, the gentleman on the, on the, on the left, marries Elizabeth Salmon. Um, they are two very old families in the vineyards of Champagne uh, in our little village of Marais sur -Aille. So 202 years ago, they marry and immediately they, they create a business and put their, their two surnames together of Bilicard and Salmon. Um, and really it was, a, it was three three people that were involved. Uh, Elizabeth's brother, a gentleman called Louis Salmon, was also involved. And what we found in the writings and the books and through, through um, and, you know, the, the, the family stories is Nicolas Francois Bilka, so my direct uh, heir, was more of the businessman uh, or entrepreneur. Uh, and he was very bold in creating that business. And Louis Salmon was more of the winemaker. That's roughly how they split the roles. And, and really, uh, what, why does it matter is, is really having this unbroken family chain ensures that two things, the, the knowledge and the know-how transfers through. So it's never been an external manager, it's always a family 
a member that leads the house and he has to make sure the family values are lived through by everybody. And, and also what's very important in our business and we'll come and talk about it um, in the vineyards bit is, is the relationships we have with the people here. Bilkar means a lot in the Champagne region. It means a lot for quality and trust and, and excellent winemaking, excellent viticulture. And, and that's really important um, that a lot of things here is done on handshakes and trust. Uh, and we know we have a, a, a great people ecosystem around our house. Obviously the people that make the wine, but also all the growers relationship that we have. And that's super important. The, the, the main thing and the main, um, the main um, I guess, vehicle on how we get that heritage to continue to live in is, is what we call the tasting committee. So that's a couple of slides on, and I will show you. Um, Bilka is, is a small house and we've retained um, that sort of artisan know-how. We, we haven't gone to the big industrial approaches. That's not how it works. So what you must understand, and that's the reason why we're so proud of our name and, and we put our surname on it, so we can't hide. Every single base wine, so that's typically a parcel or a village for a base wine, every single blend, every single bottlings of aging on lease, dosage, release on the market. Everything like this is tasting by the, these beautiful people in the picture. Well, we have eight members. Um, that's a very time consuming um, expert work. So to give you an idea of scale, uh, on the 2019 harvest, I and the tasting committee tasted over 220 base wines. And this is a base of what then becomes the cuvées that, that we're going to get to talk about. And uh, I'm sure every, sorry. Matt, Matthew, just a quick question. So I can see you there um, on the right. And in the center, I think that's Antoine Biacart. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. And then so who, have, who else is on the tasting committee here? So you have, is it good? you have four family members of three different generations. So the, the older gentleman with the, with the, um, the gray jumper, is my great uncle. He's 96. Okay. Wow. Uh, he's fifth generation of Birka. Then you have Antoine on the right hand side with a darker jumper, uh, with sixth generation. He still works for the company. Eric, you know him. Yep. Um, and the ex CEO of the house is a gentleman on just in the front on the right, uh, Francois. So Antoine and Francois are sixth generation, and I'm seventh. So we have three generations of Birka that there and make sure we, we are actively involved in shaping these blends and making sure that they are worthy of carrying our surname. And that's not a role we take lightly. So when, when I talk about, you know, yes, we are 200 years old, yes, we family owned, why does it matter? Because we are there every day making the ones. However, we know that we must get the very best of expertise there is possible in Champagne and we have four non-family members. One you can't see because he's taking the picture. So the empty chair is Francois Domi, who was our chief winemaker for 30 years before I retired. Um, because at Bilka, you never really retire. Uh, he lives in the village and comes to taste and contributes with his expertise. Keeping the know-how is really important in our DNA. On the left, uh, you see um, the gentleman smiling very happy. He's our head of vineyard because I want the vineyard and the winemaking to be always very closely working together. There is a responsibility of one towards the other. The vineyard to winemaking, it's an ecosystem. Um, the gentleman at the, behind the knee next to the, my great uncle, the younger one with the glasses, is our existing chief winemaker, a gentleman called Florence. So he is the one that physically blends the wine. It's his nose and palate. He proposes to the committee uh, and he works with the team and his assistant, or his number two, is, is a gentleman with a green jumper who used to be the chief winemaker at Gosset. Okay, so this committee tastes everything together. We write down, we normally, the base wine, we taste a raft of them, but for blends, we taste six wines at a time, completely blind, and we comment what we feel about the nose and the mouth and everybody talk in turn and we try and build a consensus. If we can't build a consensus, 
we come back and we reshape the cuvées together until we come to unanimous agreement. And Eric, you know that. You won't see me in the market much between, um, say, November and uh, late March. I don't travel. Or I can go for a couple of days, but I don't go to California then because I have to, everybody's planning is based on tastings. It's, it's um, for blend, for, sorry, for base wines, it can be up to twice a day, 11 a.m. and 4 p.m., uh, where we taste a lot, but for blending is normally 11 a.m. Uh, it, tastes, it takes about an hour, an hour and a half uh, for the tasting and then the debate and trying to get to some progress. So that's really how it's made <laughs> on, on, on the progress. And I know it's a bit laborious, but, but it ensures that the build car quality and the build car DNA um, live through and the heritage is there. Nice. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's different. No, no, you know, most houses they have scaled up, they have delegated the authority, the family is not involved, or there is no family at all. Um, the growers, they will say it's one person making the wine on their own. We neither. I want, we need the DNA and the heritage of the family, and we taste, you know, we, we, we good tasters of wine. Um, uh, but we also get the, the best of people who are non family, but they, they know the Bill Carr taste and they're part of the extended family of Bill Carr family. Excellent. So that's, that's uh, sort of the, the family heritage piece. Um, however, to, to be able to make an exceptional wines, like the three cuvées, Nicolas Francois, Elisabeth Salmon, and Louis Salmon will talk about, you need exceptional grapes and terroir. That's the baseline. So um, Bilkar Salmon, to give you some, some ideas and some numbers. So we're based in maroilles sur aille which is physically at the junction of Vallée de Marne and Montagne de Reims. So the slope here, like, well, you can't see, but just there is Montagne de Reims. Uh, and I, I drive through it every day. Um, so we work 20 kilometer radius around our village for 90%, 95% of the grapes we get, we source. So we go, to give you an idea there, we don't go further than uh, Festini on the pink area. We source our grapes in Montagne de Reims from Rilly la Montagne to Ambonnet Bouzy. And Côte des Blancs, we go all the way, which is a purple area. We, we are what people sometimes call, and I like this expression, a super grower. I'll explain why. Not 100% of the grapes come from us, but let's be clear. About a third is owned land, okay, by us. 40% on top of that, which is something that's evolved and we've accelerated that recent years, is land that we don't own, but my team physically worked it. So that's over close to 150 hectares, where we do all or a significant proportion of the vineyard work, from pruning to tying to, to plowing the, 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 the land to all of that stuff. So we have the same control as if we owned it, okay? And the, the remaining 25% is long-term supply contracts that we've, we've worked with sometimes for centuries, which is a point about, I talk about the importance of the family name and the family relationships. So they work with a specific charter on how they can work, they get controlled on it. A number of the people have been trained by our vineyard team and the exchange experience and they get the support. So we have a lot more control than people think about our vineyard management because you know you can be uh, own the land but a lot of landowners they have to outsource because they don't have the machinery or the teams we have both and we support other growers on this 150 hectare we do that uh, the 20 kilometer radius is important because this is where all the pro all the grand crew and the premier crew are and that's where we concentrate our efforts um, so I'll come back to the village when we talk about the cuvées, but we are very, very particular about um, the vineyard we work, the, the crew we work in, and what grape come from what crew. I'll give you an example. Ambonnet is a, is a crew I love for Pinot Noir, a very well-known grand crew of, of, um, of, uh, of, uh, of Montagne de Reims, which is about 10 kilometers away from here, 12 maybe. Um, I don't want Chardonnay from Ambonnet. 
for me, we go for the old balance. Um, Montagne de Reims, I want Pinot Noir. Valet de Marne, I want Meunier. Côte des Blancs, I want Chardonnay. So we have a very purist view. Not only when we say it's Grand Cru, we got the grape we want from a particular crew. I don't want another grape from a crew that's not well known for it. And the, the area that you're located in there, Maurice or I, right, and there's I right there as well. This is kind of, this is in the Valley de la Marin, but it's, it's, it's a little bit distinct from the rest of the valley. I think some people call it the Grand Valley, right? Yes. And it's, it's you... not, it, 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 it's not, to be fair, if you want to be honest, it's neither Valle de Marne nor Montagne de Reims, as you say. It's a bit of an in-between because it's right at the, the end of Clos saint hilaire It's technically uh, Montagne de Reims. When you drive, it's technically there. But because you can see Valle de Marne, somebody one day drew the line. But it's not, you, you, can, you can see the, the, the yellow bit where we are with the circle. Yeah. You just needed to put the, the green area you know, to have Aïe, Maroy, etc., and it would be the same thing. So you have much more Pinot Noir in that area versus Pinot Meunier. Yes, definitely. In Maroy, in Maroy, for me, I get my Pinot Noir. I don't get Meunier from Maroy. Meunier, I love um, Damry, Venteuil, um, Festini, Lovrigny. I mean, the, 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 the things are too small. But we, and also our version of Valet de Marne is we stay close to Epernay. We don't go very far. So the, the left bit you see, why it's N, we don't go there. We and don't yes. go further than Festini, <clears throat> for sure. Got it. And, and one thing that you had said, you know, I listened when you were, came here last year, something that you mentioned that always stuck with me, if I remembered it correctly, is you said, you know, you liked Pinot Noir from limestone soils. Yep. Um, and I was wondering, is that because, um, it provides a, it gives you a little bit of a racier, a little bit more uh, elegant style, or maybe you can elaborate on that. Yeah, I, well, look, it, it, it's, I respect, we respect all terroir at Bilka, and we're not saying some of them are, are superior to others, and, and we're not there to rewrite uh, the story of Premier Cru and Grand Cru. However, the Bilka style, all the cuvées are different, but they have to share three adjectives in common. Finesse, elegance, and balance. And elegance in particular is hard to get on clay. I think you get chunkier wine, deeper. Um, we don't particularly suit our style. Um, so it's not um, a ranking. So we know uh, some people sometimes tell us, well, you know, you're a bit snobby, not wanting all of this. I said, no. Because they say it's still premier cru. You know, I give you a good example. You're absolutely right. If you want to be geeky about it, Montagne de Reims, you have a road between Epernay and Reims. And you have, when you drive from Epernay, on the right-hand side, Rilly la Montagne, all the way to Ambonnet. That's where the soil changes. If you go left, you go towards the clay. If you go right, you go towards the chalk. And the further right you go, the more you go towards the chalk. So I don't go left. <laughs> I, 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 and I have some friends, some grower friends that do good wines. You know, we talked about uh, Egli Vrigny. He's on the left. Yeah. Um, uh, it, it's no uh, criticism at all, but for my style, I have to go right. And actually, I have to be quite right. I, I would much rather get my Pinot from Ambonnet, Verzenay, Verzi, which is where Nicolas Francois come in. We'll talk about it. Then on the left for the Bill Karstein. Fantastic. So that's for the, the, the terroir bit. The bit we should talk about as well is, is the way of working within this terroir. Um, so at Bilka, uh, way before this became fashionable, one of the things we get taught, uh, well, it's not get taught, it's the family way, we treat the vineyards as we treat our children. That's not new because we know they are the future. You know, we need them. It's kind of a normal thing. So, so in normal um, life, now, with the, all the badges and the accreditation, that means we're one of the few houses that's got both accreditation of haute valeur environnementale, so that means sustainable agriculture and European level, um, but also something much more specific, 
called viticulture durable en Champagne. And that means sustainable viticulture specific to the Champagne terroir, mm. who acknowledges the fact we are further north and therefore we can be more precise on certain things and less precise on others, where the, the previous one is European wide. And that's another name to say sustainable viticulture, cleaner agriculture, really. Um, and we, we adapt these methods plot by plot. So some plots are organic because we think it suits them. The age of the vineyards work. The, the close antillaire is a great example because the vines are 60 years old. They have that particular terroir. When, when we made the test, the vines reacted well. Sometimes it doesn't react so well. And therefore we adapt plot by plot. The minimum baseline is sustainable agriculture. We can go up to organic. Um, fundamentally, our effort is not to, um, to talk a lot about that because we have a say here to say what matters is the taste in the glass. Okay? We, it's not like we're selling you. If we were selling you grapes raw and I was shipping it to you, then it would matter a lot more about the grape. Here, it's great that's fermented twice We've blended, et cetera, et cetera. So we prefer to talk about the wine, but rest assured that um, we know that um, th to get the exceptional wines, you need exceptional grapes. And some of it comes with the territory and some of it comes with how you've grown them. That, that's, that's, that's an obvious say. Um, and this, you've got a great picture of the claw here. So you can see, actually, that's an interesting answer for you, Eric, on, you see that this is Maroy Sorai, so this is my village. That's 100 meters or less than where I physically sit right now. You see the hills there? That's Montagne de Reims. Mm. But some, for some reason, somebody drew a line at the little houses around there. It's, there is no real, um, real reason, if I'm honest. So we now got to the stage where we've got the family heritage and the know-how, I think. We've got exceptional grapes from the best terroir that we can blend. So that's beautiful if we were just farmers, but we are winemakers. So the next step is what's different about Belcar in, in, in winemaking? Now I've got my Ambonnet, my Menil sur Roger, my, uh, my Maroy sur Aïe, the very best of very best, the Premier Cru and the Grand Cru, but I need to make wine. And um, grapes left to their own devices, they make vinegar, so we have to be careful. Um, so the first thing that's perhaps a little different to, to, about Bielka is every uh, mou must get tasted by the wine making team before being directing in the winery. First of all, to ensure the must is, is consistent with the terroir in terms of quality. If there is rot, etc., whatever, that gets discarded. And, and a specific technique to Bielka is how we make our fermentation, our first fermentation. And that's a process that was brought in by my great uncle, you know, the gentleman with the gray jumper you saw. He brought that back in the 1950s of doing cold fermentations. So fermentations, um, I, I'm rubbish at Fahrenheit and Celsius, but we, we make them at 13 degrees Celsius uh, instead of 25, 30, which means our alcoholic fermentations take easily three weeks instead of two, three days. It's a slow process, it's painful, it's a lot more effort. Um, however, you're, we are convinced that we're able to uh, extract a level of finesse and elegance by doing this very, very slowly than by doing it quickly. It costs more money, it takes more people, it takes more infrastructure, it's, it's, it's a pain in the neck to do. However, the result is there. And that's the reason why we keep doing it for over 60 or 70 years. I mean, when I so think of see, when, when I think of Beacard Salmon, I you know one of the the big bullet points that comes out for me always is low temperature fermentation um, and its impact on the style. I just just wanted to emphasize that because um, I think it's something that really separates Beacard from from some other some other maison or some other uh, growers. And you know what? In addition to that, Eric, to add to your comment because it is very important, you're right, is what it does is it gives our wines an acidic backbone that guarantees them a lot longer longevity. Because we only use the first press at Bilka, that goes without saying, but our particular method, other than it gives the freshness that you mentioned, it gives also more longevity to the wine. And when we go to the prestige cuvées 
who can be kept 20, 30, 40 years, a lot of that comes from that method. Yeah. And you can see from the picture there, or some of you can see, um, you see the tanks are all thermoregulated to be able to do parcel by parcel, crew by crew vinification. So when I say I tasted 220 base wines, these things, actually they slice in two inside. You have two parcels or two crew. Hence, I've got lots of them and I need to taste 220 base wines. Wow. Other feature of Bill Carsalmo on the next page is we vinify primarily in stainless steel, but not only. We also vinify in um, barrels, Burgundian oak barrels, and the larger casks that you see at the, at the back end. They all give different ratios of, of, oxy, of, of um, uh, oxygenation um, that we are we're trying to get to. And really, that's going to give us an additional layer of complexity. Some cuvées, we have two, are done 100% in, in barrels, the Brut Soubois and the Clos Saint-Hilaire. But the majority of others are a blend of stainless steel and barrels. And, and we really brought back the barrels back in 1990. Uh, you have to know that before, um, until I think the 1960s, everything was done in barrels in Champagne. Uh, but the hygiene wasn't so good and it, the level of control was less good. Um, so we moved to stainless steel like most other houses. But having moved completely out of wood, we realized also that we, we, there are things we couldn't reproduce with stainless steel. And the micro-oxidation that the barrels give you is something you can't reproduce. So we brought it back. And a specific uh, element of bill car barrel rooms, so we have over 400 Burgundy and Oak barrels, 16 bigger cars. They are, the barrels are over 15 years old. So it's not because we vinified in oak that we want the wines to be oaky. They, they've, they've lost all the oakiness that they can give to the thing. We are trying to gain weight and structure and texture. That's really why we vinify in oak. Um, that's an additional sort of layer of complexity and elegance that we can build in. Mathieu, um, Chris Webb, who is a, a representative of ours in, in Los Angeles, here, he's asking, are there plans for more large cask cuvées in the future? Uh, currently, no, is, is, is the short answer. Uh, we incorporating a little more barrel in the Brut Reserve. I mean, it's... it's it was around 3%. We're now at about 5 So it's still very small, but we think it, it's accretive to, to, to in, in our further progress in terms of quality. Um, Brut Sobois is, I think, the one that has the ability to do more of, uh, but it remains a small bottling. Uh, so it, at the moment, it's not in anticipation of a specific new cuvee. We've already got 11, and that's a lot. Yeah. But it's really helpful to enrich our reserve wines and continue to gain further quality. Got it. You know, I was, when I was there last year, I was so impressed with uh, the investment that you've made in these, uh, these large casks, these foudre. Um, yeah. I saw barrels from French barrels. I saw, saw Austrian Stokinger barrels yeah. in there. And it was just, and the temperature control that you had inside of all these barrels, it, it's, Quite a, uh, it, it's quite impressive what you're investing into the future of Biocard Salmon. We are, we are the first ones to have these because you, you, you're spot on, Eric. We, we were able to do our cold fermentation in, in the small barrels because you can temperature control them from the outside by bringing the temperature of the shade down. Yeah. But we had to invest in new technology to be able to do cold fermentation in the large cask because there's too much liquid. You can't. You can't cool it down from the outside. And that's, uh, you know, the, the other benefit of being family owned, my family reinvest all the money in making better wines every year. Hence, I'm able to have these beautiful tools that help me make better wines. Yeah. Um, Incredible. You don't do that when you're a big group. You can't. So um, at that stage, we've done our wines. Um, so you, you, you look at the, the four main elements that it takes to make an exceptional wine. You need the best people. We talked about that. You need the best uh, terroir, parcels, grapes. We've talked about that. You need to make the best, have the best winemaking approach. We think we've talked about that. 
The last factor, which is the one often less talked about, is time. You cannot cheat with time. Current, um, uh, our current society would make you pretend you can. Grand marketing would pretend you can. Take it from somebody that lives and breathes winemaking every day. You can't. And for some reason in Champagne, that's often um, less well understood. Um, nobody would think about opening um, an Opus One or a Romane Conti or Chateau Petrus 2016. In Champagne, they think it's okay. I'm sorry. If you work with the very best parcels like the one I talked about earlier, if you have the very best vinification methods, for the best of the best that we're gonna come on to talk about, you need to leave time. And we are one of the houses that ages its wine the most. Um, that ranges from three years for a Brut Rosé because we want to preserve the fruit and fruit fades over time, therefore we no point aging it further, to close to 10 years on the Brut Soubois, which is a non-vintage, or five years for a Blanc de Blanc. That's non-vintage. And for the Prestige Cuvées, we always release later. Because you can't cheat with time. And hence, we, you never seen our founders range, um, you never seen our founders range release, release, release before 10 years. Because the time only is the complexity that you gain in the time is not something a human process can accelerate. You need to leave the time working. And at Berka, no, we're very careful with the tasting committee on respecting that. You know, the founders cuvées that we are offering this fall, they're the, you know, 13, at least 13 years old is sort of the minimum. Well, I mean, I was checking the other day a little bit where, where people were as in other, other very good houses. Most houses have released their 2012. I haven't, I haven't started releasing my 2008. I've wow. just gone out of, of Elizabeth Salmon 07. So I'm between six and seven in the prestige range. Yeah. Um, it, it, to be honest with you, I think if it made wines better to release them sooner, I would love to do it. But you can't, you can't cheat with time. I think it needs the ripeness that we are getting in, in the current years, maybe in the future, we might be able to save a year or two. But, but right now with what I have in the cellar, I believe this 10 years is sacrosanct. There is no point trying to break that. Or if yeah. you're doing that, it may be good for your for your wallet, but it's bad for your tasting experience. And I care about that tasting experience. Um, the couple of pictures, actually, I was flicking through. There's one that perhaps I should talk about before we come on talk to the wine. That's beautiful bottles laying in our cellar. It's one of what we call the nursery. So that's, that's a, our barrel room. Um, the one with the 400, that's a large barrel room in the close antilia in the middle. I think that's the one after. Um, Yes, that one. Um, I, I don't know whether the, the picture does it justice, but that's what we call the nursery. So champagne is about blending. The tasting committee, at, you know, it's typical. We're going to talk about blends of Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, all of that stuff. Great. However, you have this little thing called disgorgement and dosage. When you remove the dead yeast and replace it with a mix of sugar and reserve ones. At Bilka, we spend as much time with the tasting committee agreeing the blend of the 74 centiliter as the one last centiliter. These little tanks here, we call it nursery because they are tiny tanks, contains a specific catalog of older reserve wines or reserve wines with a specific typicity. They're particularly spicy, particularly mineral. And we do, oh, Florent does mini blends because we, for us, it's like seasoning an exceptional dish. You know, when you have a beautiful lobster, if you finish it with, I'm French, so with garlic and parsley, that's one kind of lobster. But if you finish it with paprika, that's gonna end up feeling very different in your tasting experience. And we've spent, we spend considerable amount of time getting that liquor dosage right. That's the amount of detail we're prepared to go into to deliver you the best match for the wine. That's another example of, yeah, the amount of precision and efforts we, we put in. You know, just to, to go back to what you were talking about earlier. So the, the tasting committee, how many times a year do they taste the wines? 
I was there this morning. I mean, okay, there are 365 days a year. You take the weekends out. Okay, that's 100 days. I would say around the year, 60% of the days I'm here or 70% of the days I'm here, I, I, there is a tasting in some shape or form. It's incredible. So it's, it's, you know, it's on the order of hundreds of days a year. Oh yeah, 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 for sure. Um, it's, and it's impressive and, and, you know, just the precision and, and, and the, the knowledge or the, the people that you bring to that table, right? So you've got two or three generations of beer cart. On top of that, you know, you have the people that manage the vineyards, the people that make, you know, that do the winemaking uh, in the Shea. Uh, it's just an, it's, it's really a kind of an impressive process. And I think that, um, I think that, you know, it shows definitely in the wines. Um, um, it's impressive. We care deeply about it. Everybody around the table care about it. And, and we don't take that name lightly when we put our name to it, it has to be exceptional. Should we come and talk about a little bit the, 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 the three cuvées? Yeah, let's do is that at the right me, time. Yeah, it definitely it is. And then let me ask a uh, question from uh, our audience. So Gino Fumia, who is a, uh, a sales representative you've met before, he's in um, the South Bay, San Jose um, area. He, um, he, was, he was asking, you know, how does climate change influence your plans for the future? That's a, that's a big and good question. Um, so if we take a short-sighted view so far, and this is not the view we're taking, but I'm, I'm giving you a more complete answer. Um, climate change has helped us in the sense that historically in the 70s, 80s, and to a certain extent, 90s, we had to add sugar to must to be able to get the fermentation going. As in, there was not enough maturity in the grapes to be able to get to that. That's no longer the case. So, so far, so good. However, unfortunately, it's not going to end there. We all know that, and we're planning for that. Um, so, uh, we want, the key for us, and the key for all champagne makers, I think, is going to have to, how you con continue to have freshness in your wine when you have hotter weather. So we have gone more precise on half days of harvesting and harvesting earlier. So I was telling um, Eric earlier, we're going to start harvesting now in 20th of August, probably. So that's one way of capturing the freshness. And last year, we, we, built, uh, we rebuilt our pressing rooms so that now they are refrigerated. So, and we've doubled the capacity, not because we press double, because we want the grapes to keep fresh. And if you double the capacity, that means you press twice as fast, the same capacity, and therefore you get the freshness away. So that's one of the things practically that we do. Uh, when we plant vines now, obviously this is a very long cycle. You know, we had phylloxera, the disease actually, the Americans helped us a lot. Otherwise, it would be any vineyards in France. You're welcome. The base, thank you, <laughs> the, the base of the, of the vines planted um, in the 50s, etc., the ones we used, 60s, 70s, they were, they were selected to be early maturing because they were struggled to get to maturity. Obviously, now we are adapting the, the plants to be able to get slow maturity, which means it will take longer. So there are plenty of things we can do. Uh, however, as a citizen of the world, we, we're super concerned. Um, you know, we invented the low carbon footprint before this, this word even existed. Um, my 20 kilometer radius is there for a reason. Our packaging never comes from places that are far. So we, we, we're super careful on what we can do to try and limit that. But however, we suffer like you, the consequences of, of a system. Um, I'm, I'm concerned generally about the trend, but I'm quietly confident that we've identified a lot of adjusting mechanism that should, be, should help us manage that and contain that for the years ahead. However, we need to continue to progress for sure. Sounds great. Thank you. Any other questions before we move to the wine? No, let's, let's continue. I have some other questions, but let's, I think you might answer some of them in, in this next uh, introduction of the Founders Cuvée. So 
let, let's be clear about the founders QB. So they call founders because they have the name of a founder of our house. Um, this is the pinnacle of champagne. Let's not, you know, we, I'm a Northern Frenchman and therefore sometimes we, we can be accused of not shouting, you know, loud enough about this is an exceptional product. Um, this is the very best of what you can find in Champagne. It is definitely the very best of Le Parsam. Let's, 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 let's make no mistakes about that. This is, we often say our Champagnes have to be a supporting act in the moment of happiness. No, this is not supporting act. They are the moment of happiness in the bottle. That's what they're here for. Um, they done very selectively in very few years. So I checked the other day, Nicolas Francois, which is a black label, um, has only been done 15 times in the last 40 years. It's not a lot. When you compare to a lot of other houses, they vintage a lot more frequently. Um, this, is, this is an example of how selective we are. So this is the very best of our house, done only specific years uh, and very small bottlings. The first one I wanted to talk to you about is Nicolas Francois, the black label, which is the next one. So that has the name of, there were three involved, but the, the, the real, the founder of all founders is Nicolas Francois. And this is for me, the more classic version of, of what uh, an amazing champagne should be. Why, why classic? It's a blend. It's a blend of Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. We lose the Meunier in these prestige cuvées. We love Meunier dearly. However, Meunier doesn't age as gracefully as Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. And these are, it's 14 years old today and we know some people are gonna keep it 10, 15, 20 years in their cellar. Therefore, we want to give that longevity to the wine. 60% Pinot Noir from the very best crew of Montagne de Rhin. So this is crew like Ambonnet, Verzenay, Verzi, Choc, and Maroy sur Aïe, and Aïe typically. And Chardonnay, only Côte des Blancs, Chouilly, Avise, Cramont, Menil. That's basically the end of it. A blend of, of grapes, but also blends of vinification methods. So 2006 is, was quite a rich year. And therefore we only added a small proportion of oak barrels who tend to add further weight to the wine because it was already a natural sort of rich year. There was no point adding too much. So we added 5% for the complexity. And, and, and the way it's done here is, I talked to you about the tasting committee is basically the very best base wines in the very base years are reserved for these few days. That's what really happens. So yeah. it's typically all the vines, or the very best terroir, of course, but all the vines, low yielding, that's just gonna give us the best expression. Um, and to talk about a minute about 2006, I love 06. I love 06 because it's approachable. For me, it's a, it's a sort of a ball of joy. It, it resembles 98 in many ways for those of you that, that have the experience of that. It's, it's richer and rounder, which makes it a great tasting experience now. So we have two vintages on the go at the moment, 2002, which is like the, the mother of all vintage in Champagne for the last 30 years, and 2006. I have two cellars in my house. I have the cellar that's at the level of the house and I have one deep in the choke. 2006 is in the upper cellar, as in the one we drink today, 2002 is deep in the choke. For me, it's a great, it's a great tasting experience. Now, next five years, it will age, no problem. So don't be concerned if you want to keep it 10, 15. But I, I think it has reached a great stage. Um, and, and the great expression of Pinot Noir, in particular with that slight bitterness in the finish, like coffee finish. Low dosage, six gram is technically an extra brute, but, but we, leave it, we leave it as, as brute. Uh, we have bottles and uh, we have magnums as well. For those of you that plan to age, Magnum. You know, in this wine right now, I, I had some, I've had plenty of time to get into my cellar over the past three or four months. And, uh, and this wine is just, as you said, it's showing so well right now. I also had, a, I opened a bottle of 2002, which I probably shouldn't have, but I did. And it's more reticent. The, the 2006 is really, I think, shows well in the glass. Um, and just brings a lot of uh, pleasure right now. 
I think to, to, to go about the, the sales things, I think for restaurants, I intend to serve them not in 15 years. 06 is the one to do. But depending on who asks us, because obviously we distribute in France directly, and, and, and the friends that follow Nicolas Francois, I ask them when they intend to drink it, and I tend to also focus on what kind of drinker they are. If they are the sort of specialists that are trying to get you know, the very best years, et cetera, et cetera, go for O2. If you're a collector, go for O2, no problem. If really you're somebody that's there to have an exceptional bottle of champagne because it's that, and you're going to open it in the next, now, in the next few years, buy 06. Just don't even, don't even uh, ask yourself the question. Great. Um, yeah, 14 years wine, hard to find now from, from other, other houses, you're going to struggle. Um, and that's probably the one, the, the following slide that actually I should have started there. Nicolas Francois is, has had his claim of fame. Um, uh, it, it was voted champagne of the millennium. Uh, that's from jury of expert, right? This is ranging from Richard Julian, Jancis Robinson, etc. So it is very well known within the, 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 it's a small quantity. So it's not like the big brands at Opregnon, the Cristal, etc. Um, but, but within the best experts, everybody knows Nicolas Francois is right up there. You know, we finished first with 1959. Uh, we finished second with 1961. You know, that was a brute vintage. That's, that's the same name as, as Nicolas Francois of his time. And we didn't get to that, you know, ahead of a, of a small competition. Uh, you know, Don Perignon 61, same vintage, finished fifth. Uh, Krug 61 finished eighth. And sometimes we, we can be accused of not shouting loud enough about the quality. So today I'm trying to correct it. This is Nicolas Francois is right up there. Then let's move to the lady of the house. Um, the queen of the house. Um, we often say Brut Rosé is a princess of rosé. You know, she's fruity, bubbly, fun, obviously very well known. Um, bigger quantities. Um, Elizabeth is the queen of rosé. So there is a seriousness to Elizabeth that you don't get in the Brut Rosé. It's a lot more Venus, you know. If you speak to people in Champagne, the winemakers in Champagne, and you ask them, what is the very best Champagne rosé there is? It's Elizabeth Salmon. We are the house of rosé. And believe me, when we make prestige rosé, we make the very best prestige rosé there is. How it's made? 50% Pinot Noir. 50% Chardonnay. Pinot Noir, Montagne de Reims, Chardonnay, Côte des Blancs. The particularity of that rosé is obviously always in rosé, the quality of the red wine. The red wine here comes from a parcel called Valofroy. Valofroy is on the hill, uh, 200 meters there, uh, overlooking Bilcar Estate. Um, which is a, a bigish parcels of wines that are vines that are 70, 80 years old. Um, so I struggle to get two, 3,000 kilos a nectar on this, but I get a red wine, a Pinot Noir, only a red wine, that you can't see through the glass when I do my blind tastings, when I do the, the base wine tastings. Wow. It's as deep as a Shiraz. We put 6, 7% of that. So obviously you don't, you, you don't want that. But really, Valofra and the best crew really give that deeper rosé expression. Um, it, it's a lot more venous, a lot more on the spices. It's an amazing aperitif for a special occasion. But it's also well, very capable of dealing with food. Spicy food as well, um, quite surprisingly. Um, and it works so well with food or without. Um, so for rosé lovers or for the guys that want something different, um, uh, I think Elizabeth is, is there for all rosé lovers. I, I'm actually, Eric was, um, well, not complaining, but he was telling me whether he could have more. Um, and as at uh, Monday, I'm out. So um, I've sold out all my Elizabeth Salmon uh, 2007. Well, we have some on containers on the way here. You, we're we're you, sold out. You do. 
we're sold out right now, but we have more on the way. Um, and so it's definitely something that we're going to offer in the fall. And, and you know, one thing that, uh, that I would just comment on here is um, when I look at this is the high portion of Chardonnay in this, the low dosage, um, and the 07 vintage, I've, you know, I've had a few vintages of Elizabeth Salmon, and I know this sounds, may sound self-serving, but this is the brightest, freshest um, one that I've had. Um, and maybe because it's the current release, but uh, it, is, it is absolutely delicious without losing that, that tension and that raciness that, that is often lost in a rosé. So it, it's really, really showing well. Thank you. No, I look. I love it too. My wife loves it a lot, a lot more than than I would like to be able to keep a few on on, on the side. But it it has that sort of little dark fruit element that that really we want to try and get uh, cassis element. I can't remember. I think it's blackberry or something. Yeah. Um, but but that's a lovely lovely wine for 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 people that whether that's retail or restaurants. I think. Um, Personally, some people like to age their rosé a long time. I like my rosé who have some fruit. So you can age Elizabeth. Some people age it 10, 20. Personally, I don't. I, I prefer to drink them within the first five years of release um, because it becomes more vinous. It becomes richer, deeper. Some people would say that makes it even better. Fine. You know, everybody's got different tastes. I like the fruitiness. I like the... I want, I want that. Uh, otherwise, I get Nicolas Francois or I get, I get Wissam. Excellent. Nice. Should we move to the, the, the Louis Salmon? So Louis Salmon, the last one, um, is, um, is the Blanc de Blanc version. So Nicolas Francois de Lecarte marries Elizabeth Salmon, my, my great, 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 great grandparents. Louis Salmon was effectively Elizabeth's brother and the first winemaker of the house. So in his honor uh, for our bicentenary, so two years ago uh, in, in 2018, we renamed the Blanc de Blanc Prestige Cuvée as Louis Salmon. And in 2007, normally it's done out of four crew, but in 2007, the tasting committee blindly decided that the best samples didn't have a V's in it. Everything is decided blind. So and sometimes you get small variation. But it has Chouilly for the precision, Menil sur Roger for the weight and the structure that it gets after it gets to seven years or so, and Cramor for the sharpness. So it's a blend of parcels from these three crew. Particularity of 07, um, different to what I was telling you before on 2006, 2007 can be quite a linear year. It hits you and is very mineral, very, very straight. So to complement a year like this, to give it that sort of microoxidation, that time we gave it more oak barrels. So, you know, I talked about Nicolas Francois 06. We didn't put more because the year was already quite rich. 2007 was more mineral than rich. Hence, we put 50% vinified in the 15-year-old oak barrels. It's about finding the balance to be able to get the best expression of the year. Um, that's obviously one for all lovers of Blanc de Blanc. Um, it's, it's, it's very long and mineral, I would say. Uh, it's possibly the two best adjectives I would, I would give it, which is a characteristic of the year. Counterbalance to a certain extent with your barrels that gives it a fuller palette than it would have had if it had been stainless steel. But it's, a, it's an amazing run line on this. Um, in terms of aging potential of the, in terms of age or drink, ready to drink now, no question. But I think it will only get uh, better uh, after five, 10 years. Uh, and obviously, as all Blanc Blanc loves an aperitif, loves seafood, oysters, langoustine, um, things like that is, is kind of, is, is quite is, is sort of designed for. You know, it's a <clears throat> absolutely racy, um, uh, you know, incredible expression, really, of the Cote de Blanc, which is is sort of the holy grail of, of uh, yep. Chardonnay-based champagne. For sure. Right. Anything else? 
I think, well, <laughs> I think actually um, I had a, and I'm, this might be on the next slide as well, but um, Sam Pompey, whom you met as well um, last year, he's, he takes care of Palo Alto, Menlo Park. You know, he was asking if maybe you could talk a little bit about Rendezvous, um, ah. the 100% Meunier bottling, this, at least the number one is, so. So that's not even, I haven't even started shipping that actually. Um, so let me tell you a little bit more about the, the genesis of all of this, because it's obviously very new and very different. Um, so we have 11 cuvées and all the time people ask us for something a little different. Um, and often we don't do it. Um, however, since 2013, we have an extensive reserve wine catalog, but that's kept in tank or in, in cask or in, in et cetera, et cetera. It's not bottled. But since 2013, we started experimenting by doing some of these would have been reserves bottled to see how the evolution and whether that helped us make better wines, not with the preconceived view of making distinct bottlings, but that was a start. And actually, as part of the tasting committee, we constantly retaste what's in the cellar, right? To see the evolution, what do we like, what do we not like, as this experiment worked, et cetera, et cetera. And it turned out, some of the experiments that worked brilliantly, and they were very, giving very different expressions of what we currently have. Because there's no point trying to do a copycat of an existing cuvee, it has to be distinct and different. And, and what what's all of that has translated is this concept of rendezvous. So these are, um, small bottlings that um, the kind of one-offs. So rendezvous is the name of the line, but here the rendezvous number one is 100% Meunier. I'll tell you more about it. But the rendezvous number two, if there is one, may not be Meunier. It could be something else that we've selected. It's always going to stay as a sort of temporary line if people want to continue seeing it. If they don't, then we'll stop. That will just go back into the reserve wine catalog and that's fine by us. That was what it was intended to be at the beginning. Um, but we have some that are blends, we have some that are Pinot Noir only, some Chardonnay only, and rough of different things. Um, but really the first one is, is Meunier and, and we kind of wanted to make a point of it one being Meunier as well, because we've been strong defendant of Meunier for way, way before it became fashionable because it's always been the majority grape in our, um, in our brut reserve, which is our largest bottling. Um, so we thought it was right as well to, to, to put that. So it's a 2014 base. Okay. Uh, so it's spent uh, six years in our cellar-ish. 100% um, Pinot Meunier, as you say, from specific terroir, Levrigny, Festini, and Venteuil. Only stainless steel because we wanted to give the purest expression of Meunier, not, not the oak barrels oxidation and at a very low dosage. It has a, about a third of reserve wines as well, um, mainly uh, 13, 12. We don't go as far back as we would do with a brut reserve, etc., because we really want to be sort of a capsule of Meunier being the fruitiness and the freshness. Um, so we are going to start shipping that in September from here. And uh, Ann Miller, who is uh, a sales representative in Los Angeles in the Beverly Hills area, she is asking, um, what is the expected ageability of the rendezvous number one? Uh, it's not built for that. So it will age very gracefully like a brute reserve or um or sort of the intermediary range but if you want aging go founders that's kind of the way to go or possibly subwa who ages very well because of the oak barrels um so i wouldn't have any concerns of people saying well i'm going to drink it over the next three to four years no problem five years but it's not one i would say lay down for for 10 20 if you do that do that as an experiment remember why it's a bit like when you buy Brut Rosé. You buy Brut Rosé because of the freshness and the fruits. In a way, Meunier is a bit like that. Um, so it's not that to keep. I think it's, uh, it's to enjoy, experiment, learn. So I think it will suit um, sort of the sommeliers always in search of something different, hard to find. 
it will suit the champagne curious, you know, the one that trying always to educate that test and try and do different things. Um, and frankly, we don't have the quantity for it to suit many more people than, than these categories. Uh, you know, but this also, is not a cellaring and keep. I also think it's great for, for just loyal uh, beer cart salon accounts and customers who just want to, you know, are just excited to try something new and different. Um, I'm sure it had wide appeal. I've already seen a lot of interest in, in this wine and I know you don't have very much. It's, it really is questionable whether we even need to talk about it in the presentation, but just because it was something new, I thought, I thought we should talk about it. Um, Look, in, in, Fr in France, so we will do limited, um, so it's not something that's available in every country. Um, as you say, it's small, so we've targeted it to long-standing sort of distributor and friends like, like yourselves that, you know, we know the community we're trying to get to. Uh, okay. And there is no point to try and make a big splash on something you have very little of. Yeah. Well, well one other thing, I've got another, uh, you know, it's just, <laughs> Anne just texted me, said, Spago has already, uh, is already, you know, signed up to put this on their, on their wine list. So, um, so Scott Stewart, whom, you know, he's the director of sales in, in, of Northern California at Chambers, it, just to, you know, change gears a little bit. He asked, you know, how is the decision made on vintages of close Saint Hilaire? Yeah, good question. So um, every year we do a vertical. So we, we retaste every single, um, every single bottle that are in the Cru saint Hilaire part of the cellar, um, blind. And they're not sequenced. So we don't put 2003 next to 2004 next to 2005. It would be too easy. So first of all, Cru saint Hilaire is not bottled every year. Sometimes the, the parcel has not given grapes that are worthy of being bottled. If they are worthy, they get bottled. Um, but what's happened recently, for example, in that vertical, we, much to our surprise, to be honest, decided that 2003, not knowing it was 2003, provided a freshness and a level that we thought was worthy of Cru saint batch. However, on the same day, uh, that's the yin and the yang, uh, there was one wine that didn't feel at the right level. We didn't know which vintage it was, but it didn't feel at the right level. That was 2004. So on the day I decided to, um, uh, to say, okay, if we have a, all the tasting committee, everybody's happy, it's at the right level, great. I also decided to reopen the bottles of 2004 and put them back into a tank. Uh, so they've gone into the nursery to see whether we can make a reserve wine sort of for the liquor, for the, the mini blend post disgorgement, but you won't have a 2004 vintage of Clos saint Got it. So everything blind tasted. We put the higher standards um, on that. Blind tasting is our guide and the tasting committee is a vehicle to get to, to that choice of preserving and improving quality. Great. You know, you know we love working with Clos saint Hilaire. Obviously, we, uh, you were kind enough to give us a second allocation this year, of sort of the last of the 2002. And it was all pre-sold before we even, it even landed here. So um, just an amazing wine to work with. Have you got the O3 yet? No, no, but that is on the, our, that is on our offer for the fall, so. Because, well, I tell you, I mean, other than the fact there is not a lot, uh, 2003 is, is quite, it was, was a super warm year in Champagne. What, what was the hottest year since 1970s or something? It was a terrible time for France. A lot of people in care homes passed away, etc. So it was not fun. So the, the clos gave, and there was frost in the spring and super warm summer. So it was a really tricky year to navigate in the vineyard. We harvested the equivalent of 2,200 bottles. Or we bottled, not harvested, but that, that only gave us that. Half of those bottles, if some of you remember, we did that bicentenary cuvee. Yeah. And the bicentenary cuvee had 2000, 2003, 2008, 2012. They were the four years. The 2003 component is 1,000 or 1,100 bottles of Clos Saint Hilaire that were reopened to go into the blend of the bicentenary cuvee. Wow. Which means that I only have 1,100 
and QVA's uh, bottles of close anti layer 3 And this is the reason why we only put in a thousand bottles for sale. I see. So it's it, close anti layer is always small, but normally it should give you 4,000, 5,000 bottles. It should, it's a nectar. Normally, a nectar in champagne can give you 12,000 bottles. At the Clos, we aim for half. Okay. But on this occasion, it's not half, it's, it's nothing. Wow. Amazing. Well, we look for, you know, I haven't tasted the O3, but we, we, I know there's a tiny amount of it, but we, we look forward to working with that for sure. Um, a, few, a few wine critics, I mean, we, we not, we've not sent it for wine critics for obvious reasons. We don't have enough, but um, a, a, to the anecdote, for those of you that know Italy, there is a wine, a, a champagne expert called Alberto Lupetti. He's the most respected wine critic for champagne in Italy. And he said this is the best 2003 old categories considered that he's ever tasted. We wow. took that as a compliment. Nice. Um, you know, I have another question from Joshua Benjamin. He's a, a, a sales representative in Los Angeles as well. He also was a, a sommelier um, at, a very, at a restaurant I liked very much in Yountville in Napa Valley. Um, and he's asking, um, he's, he just said, I'm curious about the decision process surrounding the shift from extra brut to brut nature. Yeah, let me explain. So um, extra brut was launched uh, 10 years ago. Uh, and then I don't think it was, it was quite far away from where it is today. So it has some dosage, less than the brut reserve. We had some dosage. And over time, we've changed four things, which means that I took the decision. There was no point having the same name on something that had changed so much over the last 10 years. First, and that was true of the bottling before, with the last extra brood bottling, there is no sugar added. Okay? So there's not, before it was little dosage, now it's no dosage at all. So you may as well give it its proper name. What gave me the confidence of that is, is three different things. That's now spent at least four years in our cellar. Okay. So it's yeah. four years from the first time we release it, which means it will typically a bottling like this would be on the market 18 months. So it's four to five. Okay. Four years is an awful lot of time for a non-vintage in that price range. So four years aging. The second thing that I think is very important for me having the confidence I can continue to do a zero dosage that has a build car style and of top quality. The, the Brut Nature has 10 harvests in it, 2006 to 2015. 2015 is the dominant year, is 45%, and the rest is reserve wine from, from 14 to 06. Thanks to a Solera system, you know Solera is where you empty a little bit every year, Sure. So it turns the year, which, which clearly didn't exist in the early stages of extra brut for sure. Um, so you have, this, you, have this ten, you have this 10 harvest and the solera. So if you, were, if you were able to travel through time and go back to what was the expression of extra brut when it was at the genesis and what is now is the um, brut nature, I, I, we can't give it the same name. It's, it's a fundamentally different wine. That's in style, of course, respect the things we were able to get to extribute, but I think it's more precise now. That's so a, that's exciting. It, it's not a revolution. Don't expect a revolution in taste. Expect an evolution in taste. So people that liked extra brut before are very, very likely to like the brut nature because from the last cut of extra brut to the brut nature, the differences are mainly in the solera and the additional one year of aging. So two very powerful levers, but I think it's better and clearer to have that name. And, and things have changed. It's not just a change of name. There is some changing in the philosophy that, that, that deserve that change of name. So we have some magnums on the pre-sale of the Brut Nature. Um, well, that's a smart call. Yeah. Um, you know, we could, I'm sure that we could go on and on and on. You're such a wealth of knowledge and I feel like you've, really um, brought us into Champagne today and brought us into Morai, brought us into Beacart Samon. It's, uh, I really appreciate you making the time and 
um, you know, I wanted to share with you too. So Suzanne actually just sent a little comment through the chat here. She said, um, it's been a wonderful hour. Thank you. Very informative. We look forward to seeing you when the world opens. Um, and then she had to sign off for another meeting. So I wanted to share that with you. That's very kind. Please thank her. And, and, and thank you, Eric, because I know you're working super hard and obviously the rest of the team. You know, the relationship of, with Chambers is very important to us. That's the reason why you're one of the few distributors in the world to have um, the entire range. And I know some allocations, you think they, they're too small. Um, but believe me, some distributors would dream of having half of some of the numbers you get. And, and, and that's a credit to the quality of the relationship and the trust we have in you and your team. Well, don't worry, we don't hesitate to ask. Is always good to ask. <laughs> I've noticed. I've noticed. You can, you can answer any way that you like. Um, uh, well, uh, again, thank you so much, Mattia. This has been an, an amazing, um, more than an hour. I think we're at an hour and 15 minutes. Um, it's a pleasure, and, and thank you. We look forward to a successful fall, a successful pre-sale, and we appreciate all the support. It's a pleasure to represent yeah. the Via Card San Juan in California. Well, we share that pleasure. So thank you so much. And thank you to the team for all their works in the field. as well. Thank you. All right. Take care. And thank you to the audience. Thank you so much. Okay. Let's go and have some champagne now. Oof. Sounds like a plan. Bye-bye. Thank you, people. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.